thank you everybody for showing up here on a Tuesday night to talk about birds. Um, my name's Laura. I work for the SPCA for Monterey County. I'm a wildlife rehabilitation technician. I've been there about eight years now as staff. Um, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, our wildlife center and more specifically about how we uh, rescue birds and so that you as members of the public can help us out with that because I know that you guys, uh, as birders, are some of the first people who see birds that might be in distress. And it would be super helpful if uh, any of you who are interested in learning more about uh, what to do when you see a bird that you think it needs help. So what we're going to talk about today, I'll talk a little bit about the SPCA Wildlife Center, what we do, the types of birds that we treat, uh, common issues that we see, why birds come into us in the first place how to tell if a bird needs help, um, tips for safe handling and transport. Um, again, if uh, your only experience with birds is watching them from a distance uh, and appreciating them that way, it can be uh, intimidating to suddenly be face to face with a bird that needs help and you don't know what to do. So I'll talk to you about that. Um, and then we'll talk about other ways that you can help birds and I have a few resources. At the end, we'll bring the lights up and I'll have some more hands-on um, displays with some stuffed animals, because I don't have live birds with me. <laughs> um, but I'll show you how I pick up different species of birds um, and uh, uh, give you tips on how to do that yourself. So, uh, who here is not familiar with the SPCA of Monterey County? Anybody? You guys are all great. You're in the know. Um, a lot of times we deal with people who have never heard of us before or didn't realize we had a wildlife center because people hear SPCA and they think dogs and cats. Um, but we have a full service wildlife rehabilitation center and we are the only one in Monterey County. We're the only people who are permitted to rehabilitate wildlife through the Department of Fish and Game. We treat between two and 3,000 patients every year and about 70% of those, give or take, are birds. So we do quite a few mammals, but the vast majority are birds. And as you can see, we do everything from teeny tiny little hummingbirds all the way up to eagles and everything in between. Um, and our ultimate goal is to rehabilitate and release animals back into their habitat whenever we can. That's why we're here. Uh, we wanna make sure that all of these wild animals can go back out into the world and continue to thrive. So common species that we see at the Wildlife Center since 2013, which is when we started using our online database, um, which is a lot easier to search than all of the handwritten paper records that came before that, <laughs> we've had uh, over 250 different species of birds that have uh, come into our Wildlife Center. Some of those are very uncommon. Um, for instance, in the time that I've been there, I've seen two Laysan albatrosses, I've seen two red-footed boobies, I think one, um, yeah, I, I think one Nazca booby, you guys may have heard about that, yeah. they, they made the news. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so there are some very rare species that we get, and then there are some very common species. So we get a lot of gulls, we get a lot of doves and pigeons, we get many, many songbirds, especially during the spring and summer seasons when all of those little babies are on the ground. Um, we get seabirds, um, everything from pelicans and grebes and murres to little shorebirds. We get a lot of, um, last year we had a lot of uh, black owls come in. Um, so we get a little bit of everything. We also do snowy plover rehab. Um, uh, Fish and Wildlife allows us to do that and then Point Blue will come and band the birds and release them back in their colonies and do resites on them. Uh, so, Many birds, I, I can't even name all the species, but here are some of the most common ones. We have barn owls at the end there, western gold chicks, um, those are some cliff swallows, and then scrub jays. All of them babies, actually. <laughs> I get more pictures of the babies than the, than the adults because they sit still. <laughs> so why might a bird need help? There are a lot of reasons. There are some human-caused reasons, like if they get hit by cars, they get caught by people's pets, they can hit power lines or windows, they get stuck on sticky traps, um, we get oiled birds, there are both natural seeks in the bay, and then there's also the possibility that it's a more uh, human-caused oiling event. 
Um, their nests could get destroyed and we get baby birds that way. They get tangled in fishing gear. I've actually got on the table over here, there's a big jar that has a bunch of fishing lure and line that we've taken off of birds over the years. Um, rodenticide poisoning we do see in birds of prey. Uh, we also see a lot of birds of prey get shot, unfortunately. Uh, there are also environmental causes. So just in general, um, especially first year, for like hatchier birds are not as good at finding food as their parents might be. So they might come to us because there's like low food availability, weather events, we have big storms. It can take out a lot of the less experienced birds or blow them off course and end up somewhere they should never have been. Um, naturally occurring diseases, sometimes they get caught by predators that don't finish the job. So a hawk grabs a pigeon and then either drops it or gets scared away. So now the hawk is gone, but the pigeon has a bunch of wounds all over it. So we'll get birds like that as well. So how do you know if a bird needs help? Um, sometimes it can be quite obvious, like that goal clearly something is wrong with that wing, right? Um, healthy adult birds should not let you get close enough to do anything to them. <laughs> um, with the exception of species that are being consistently hand-fed by people, like, like geese and ducks at Elastero, right? <laughs> so just because a goose is letting you kind of sidle up next to it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with it. It's just very used to people. Um, pigeons can be that way as well. But in general, if it's an adult bird and it's letting you walk right up to it and like poop it on the nose, then something is, is very wrong with that bird. Um, in addition to that, you want to look for any obvious injuries. Um, what's nice about birds is that they are symmetrical. So you can look at their wings and if one of them is doing this, there's something wrong with that wing. Um, same thing with the, with the legs. You can also look for any open wounds. Um, birds that are trying to fly or run away but failing usually means that they're injured. If they're obviously lying down on their side or their back, they can't get up. Um, also, does the bird look cold or sick? If they're kind of like hunkered down and sleepy looking, they look like they don't feel very good. You know, they kind of like squint up and they're just sitting there looking sick. Uh, that's another good sign that something's not going well. Lab labored breathing, that sort of thing. Um, we'll talk about baby birds specifically because there are some of the baby birds are their whole separate thing. So. And here we are, baby birds. Um, so every year we get in a lot of baby birds that well-meaning people see on the ground and they become very concerned. Um, and many, many species of birds have to spend time on the ground. And I know that it's nerve wracking to see a little baby bird hopping around and to know that there are cats in the area or hawks or crows and this bird looks completely defenseless, but it has to stay on the ground in order to learn how to, how to fly, how to hunt for itself. Um, Fledglings that are super well feathered, like this lower picture here, that's a dark-eyed junco. Um, a bird of that age, if I saw it on the ground, I would not be concerned. So long as it looks alert, it seems perky, it's hopping around, especially if I see parents in the area, I am not concerned about that bird being on the ground. Um, versus that scrub jay up top, that is a <laughs> naked baby. <laughs> he should never be on the ground. <laughs> um, his eyes aren't even open yet. Uh, he belongs back in the nest. Um, so age definitely matters. Species also matters. Some species never have a ground stage. They shouldn't be on the ground. Um, a good example of this are swifts or swallows. They fledge directly from the nest and they, they, they don't even look at the ground anymore. <laughs> they go straight out. So if you see a swallow on the ground, um, that means that either it fell out of the nest prematurely um, or it's injured or something, something's wrong. Hummingbirds are another good example of that. Hummingbirds fledge pretty quickly from the nest. They don't have a time when they're like popping around on the ground. So the, the species can really vary and that's something that uh, if you're never sure about, if you're looking at a bird and you say, I don't know, does this bird belong on the ground or not? That's why you call us because we can look at pictures and determine if it's something that should be on the ground. And then also parents matter. So even if this Junko is old enough to be on the ground. If his parents are gone, he's not gonna have a very good 
likelihood of surviving. The parents will continue to feed their babies on the ground. They'll be checking in on them. They will be alerting them to predators. If they're things like crows or jays, they'll be chasing off predators. So they need parents. So often when people will call us with concerns about a baby bird, the first question we'll ask is, do you see any parents? Do you see a nest? Do you have any idea where this bird could have fallen from? We'll usually ask people to send us pictures or video so we can get an idea of the species, how old it is, um, what sort of nest to look for. So some birds are gonna have kind of the, the like cliche cup nest sort of nest, um, but you can't, put, you can't put a swallow back in that. They want a cavity. Same thing with um, uh, like house sparrows or starlings. They, they go into like the eaves of houses. They don't want a big open top nest. Um, so if we know what kind of bird it is, we can tell you what sort of nest to look for and what kind of parents to look for because sometimes you see a little naked baby bird and you're like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> who, who does that belong to? <laughs> um, and we can usually take a look at them. Um, actually, we have a whole chart that we refer to um, where we look at the color of the, the inside of the mouth. We correlate that with the color of the gate flanges. Um, certain birds will uh, come out what they'll, they'll start to get feathers in different parts of their bodies at different times. Um, sometimes we'll look at leg length. That's a good way to tell if you have a toey. They have, they're, they're all leg, they got, they got long legs. Um, but uh, identification is huge because then you know what kind of parents to look for. Okay, so you found a bird. You, you're pretty sure it needs help. What do you do? <laughs> um, the first thing you do is you call us because that's why we're here. Uh, we always want to talk to you about an animal that you see that you think needs help. Um, in addition to calling us, if there's any way that you can safely contain the bird in an escape-proof box or carrier, um, a lot of times birds, especially if they just hit a window, they'll be stunned and it doesn't seem like they can go anywhere. So you might leave them in an open top box thinking that they'll be fine. And then they like snap out of it and they start pinging around in your car or, or your bathroom or something. So a lid is always a good idea. Um, and if you can bring it to us as soon as possible, uh, then we can get going on any medical treatment it needs. Uh, we can give it pain management, fluids, you know, make sure that it doesn't have a broken bone, all that kind of stuff. Um, bird rescue don't. Um, don't handle the bird any more than you have to. It is really tempting um, for those of us that have pets uh, we're used to being around dogs and cats that have been domesticated for hundreds of thousands of years to, to like being around us. If, 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 in the case of some cats, they tolerate being around us. But, um, birds see us as predators. When you think about how big like a tiny little warbler is compared to you, that is, that is insane. If you got picked up by somebody that much bigger than you, you, you would have a heart attack. Um, and I have definitely seen little songbirds die just because they were being held too long. Like they just, they, they just, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a, there's something called capture myopathy. Um, it's pretty well studied in certain mammal species. We see it a lot in deer and in rabbits, um, but it can also happen in egrets and herons where constant stress will cause a buildup of lactic acid around the heart muscle. <clears throat> it's also part, called uh, white muscle disease and it will basically, the muscle will start to die and the animal will just heal over because the stress was too great. Um, and it can definitely happen with birds. So <clears throat> don't, don't handle it unless you have to. Handle it just long enough to get it into something and then leave it alone. Um, don't offer any food or water. You probably don't have what this bird wants to eat anyway, <laughs> unless you have a, a big collection of native bugs and insects in your refrigerator, um, or you are capable of of eating seed and regurgitating it into a baby bird's mouth. Um, the, the internet will tell you to feed birds a lot of really interesting things that are not bird food. Um, I had a woman bring me a dove once uh, that she had been spoon feeding oatmeal and bologna to because the internet told her to. Um, doves don't eat oatmeal or bologna. Um, and, uh, and so the improper food can not only, not only is it bad for them just with their, their gut health, they're not able to digest things like that. Um, milk is a good example. Every year I get baby birds that somebody has been giving milk to because they're babies. 
And we're just all going to think about that for a second. <laughs> Birds don't nurse. <laughs> they don't have nipples. Um, so, and they certainly don't have the appropriate enzymes in their bodies to digest cow's milk. Um, so you can make a bird sick. Um, you can also, uh, refeeding syndrome is a, is a real thing. Um, again, it's pretty well studied in mammals, but it's the idea that if you are starving to death uh, and somebody hands you a cheeseburger, it's going to cause a chemical imbalance in your cells, and it's going to cause way more harm than good. Um, they first found out about refeeding syndrome actually after the Holocaust when they liberated a bunch of concentration camps, and they gave people who had been emaciated and like starving solid food because you want to you want to give a thing food, um, and and it caused a lot of people to die because their bodies just could not handle it. So when we get seabirds in, a lot of the time they are super emaciated. By the time they beach themselves, they're really, really cold, they're dehydrated, they're emaciated. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of the um, MERS that have been washing up on the beaches. <laughs> um, so uh, many of those MERS are hatchier birds. I've had some adults too, but a lot of them are young and a normal weight for a common MER is around like a kilogram, or like 2.2 pounds. Most of the ones I saw were between five and 600 grams. So they were literally half their body weight. Um, so when a bird comes in like that, we do blood work to determine what kind of food we can offer. We hydrate them first. We go really slow. Um, if you just offer them fish right off the bat, it can cause way more problems. So as, as tempting as it is, don't try to feed the bird. Um, don't try to treat the bird yourself, So, it, which is again really hard. When you see something that's injured, you want to help. That's why you grab the bird up in the first place. Um, but it can, unless you have experience doing some of these things, it can be really hard to do it effectively and in a way that doesn't cause more stress to the bird. So we get a lot of uh, seabirds that get tangled in fishing line. And uh, what I will say about that is, uh, one thing that you could do, so like if a bird has a hook like in its neck and then it's tangled in the line in its wing and every time it moves its wing it like tugs on the neck, you can snip the line at least to take the pressure off of it, but try not to, try to resist the temptation to rip the hook out. If you had a fishing hook this big stuck in your thigh, you'd probably want some pain meds before somebody just took it out. <laughs> you'd probably want a doctor to like anesthetize the area and like maybe give you some some nice drugs to like make you sleepy <laughs> and then slowly take the hook out um but you know in the moment you see an animal it needs help and you're just like i have to get this out of them and you start pulling things out and again like the stress can be really uh damaging for these birds another thing is sticky traps um we get a lot of songbirds that get stuck on glue traps and we have specific like uh, commercial grade degreasers that we use to tease all the feathers off of the sticky trap um, because if you just try to pull them off you'll rip all those feathers out and birds sometimes can grow their feathers back but if you damage the follicles too much and they can't grow it back then that can affect releasability so like a swallow that is missing enough of its primaries can't migrate which means I can't release it um, so in the event that you have an animal in a sticky trap, you could throw like sand or, you know, baby powder or something on it to stop it from getting more stuck, you know, clear the airways so the bird isn't like, doesn't have its face stuck in glue, um, and, but just get it to us as quick as possible so that we can take it off in a more thoughtful way. Um, and then don't pick up a baby bird until you've spoken to somebody about it. <laughs> um, some baby birds absolutely do need help, uh, especially if you found it in your cat's mouth, the, it, it needs help. Um, but if you just see one in the world, uh, check in with a wildlife rehabilitator before you scoop it up, just because the, the best chance that that bird has for survival is to be with its parents. I can do, I can raise little robins as well as I can, and I'm never gonna be as good as a robin is at raising its own babies. <laughs> Okay, so it's good to have a plan before you start. So you've decided to rescue a bird. <laughs> um, so get between the bird and where it wants to go. So if you're on the beach, get between the bird and the water. 
so that it doesn't jump in the water and get away from you. Um, if you are in your backyard and you can kind of like get, shove the bird towards the fence and like get it that way, the bird is gonna try to get away from you. That is a natural thing, but be mindful of where it might want to go. You're going to want to restrain the most dangerous part of the bird first. Uh, so beaks and talons are the obvious thing, uh, but some birds also, their wings can be really strong. Mm -hmm. Things like geese um, or turkeys, like those big bodied birds uh, or pelicans, when they, when they open up their wings, it can be stronger than you think it's going to be. <laughs> um, cover the head always if you can. Um, it's gonna reduce the stress and it's going to protect you from that beak. Um, so it's a win-win. Keep the bird in a comfortable and natural position. Um, be conscious of restricting its breathing and mindful of any injuries it might have. If it looks like it has a broken wing, you know, we still want to contain that bird, but you know, try not to put too much pressure on it. Um, and some birds just aren't safe to handle without protective equipment, and you don't have to. I would never ask someone to pick up a golden eagle by themselves without any kind of protective equipment. I, people have. <laughs> I, I definitely met someone in King City who drove all the way up from, where did he come from? He drove from, uh, from like the Pinnacles, I think, with an eagle on his lap in his pickup truck. <laughs> um, and I thought for sure he must have some other kind of bird because because why would an eagle let you do that? And then, and then I got to the cab of his car and I opened it up and all I could see were the talons sticking out from underneath the blanket he had. And I was like, that's, that's an eagle. I, I can't believe he did that. Um, but uh, don't do anything that you don't feel comfortable doing. Um, we, 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 we have been trained to do this. This is my job. I get paid to, to get uh, attacked by birds. You don't have to. <laughs> don't be afraid to call us. So, avian handling. So the main, the main weaponry we're looking at are beaks, talons, strong wings, all the things that you would think. Um, something to also keep in mind, birds are different from mammals in many ways, but one of the ways that they're very different is their respiratory system. So birds do not have a diaphragm the way that mammals do. So the way that we breathe, our diaphragm flattens out and expands and it opens up our lungs and that's how we breathe in and out. Birds have a system of air sacs all over their body, and they use muscle contractions to expand and contract those air sacs. And what that means is that in order for a bird to breathe, it has to physically move its chest back and forth. So when you're holding a bird, you never want to grab like super tightly right around the abdomen and restrict the heel, because if it can't move it back and forth, it can't breathe. Um, so when we get to the point where I am, uh, demonstrating with stuffed animals. I'll show you how I hold a bird so that it can definitely breathe. Um, and then they have quote unquote hollow bones. It's not, they're not actually hollow, but they have these big chambers in their bones. And what it means is that they're brittle. Um, this is especially true when you think about tiny little songbirds. If you're handling them uh, in a weird way, which is another reason why you want to keep them in a natural position, um, it's real easy to snap those tiny little legs. Um, it's way, way easier to break a bird's bone than it would be to break a mammal of a similar size. So small bodied birds. So I'm thinking songbirds, doves and pigeons, shorebirds, uh, most small corvids, anything kind of smaller than a gull. Um, we usually use pillowcases or towels. Um, to cover the bird up and gently wrap it up like a little birdie burrito. Um, you use the towel to kind of pin the wings to the body um, and support the, um, the whole body and the feet. Um, and you don't want to restrict the keel again because then it can't breathe. Um, you wanna be gentle but firm. Little birds can, can easily slip away from you if you're not holding them uh, appropriately. You can also, if you have like a really tiny, like a finch or something, you basically just make like a cage with your hand. And the bird is in here and it can't really go very far, but you're not like grabbing it. Um, but if you can use anything beyond just your hands to pick up the bird, you're gonna make your life a lot easier. Uh, pillowcase, shirt, towel, jacket, anything you can use to throw over the bird and just kind of scoop and then get it into a box. Medium-sized birds like gulls, um, ducks, waterfowl, um, 
I'll put kind of like pelicans and turkeys in here, even though they're quite large because the hold is really similar. Um, so you're going to wrap the bird up. Also, all these pictures have the bird's head uncovered because otherwise it's a really uninteresting picture. It's just a towel. <laughs> um, especially that one with the quail. I would not leave a quail's head uncovered for very long at all because they are high stress birds, but otherwise it's literally just a picture of a towel. So in all of these examples, you would be covering the person with a towel. Um, but so you're gonna wrap the bird up uh, just like you would with a smaller bird. You'd use, uh, you know, tailor the kind of size of what you're using to the bird. So I would use for a pelican, I would use a sheet or a very large towel or blanket. Um, you're gonna hold them at waist level like a football. Um, and that is for two reasons. Let me see if I can. So I need, I need better stuffed animals. This is the only piece I have. You're gonna have to pretend that this is like three times this size. But if you hold it down at your waist, you can use your arm to kind of pin the wings. So like one of these wings is pinned by the curve of my body. My arm is pinning this other wing, and then I can control the head so it doesn't snake its head up and bite me. Um, a lot of these birds, like cormorants especially, those beaks are sharp, and they will go for you <laughs> if they can. So you want to make sure that you are controlling the head. Um, and then uh, usually you'll kind of try to control the feet. Some birds, I would say that turkeys actually really don't like, they prefer to have their feet dangling. You can try to pick them up, they struggle more. Um, I think maybe swans are kind of like that too. But most other large birds, if you can kind of like tuck the feet up, they feel a little bit more secure and it gives you a better grip. Um, pelicaniforms are special. <clears throat> um, so this order includes pelicans, cormorants, egrets, herons, um, gannets are in here too. We don't get those, but they are. So they don't have functional nares, which means that they breathe through their sides of their mouths. So whenever you are holding a pelican, which is advanced, I don't expect any of you to hold pelican anytime soon, but should you find yourself in the position of trying to hold a pelican, um, you'll see in these holds, they're holding the beak open. So they're still controlling the head, but they're holding it open so the bird can continue to breathe. You don't wanna hold the beak closed. Um, in the previous picture uh, with the cormorant, I was holding kind of behind the head because cormorants have really sharp beaks and trying to hold the beak open is, is hard. Um, they're, they're, they're really, they're sharp. They're not, they're not nice birds. Pelicans can't really hurt you that bad. They're, they're, mostly, they're mostly its size. Uh, they can get away from you pretty easily. And the tip of the beak is kind of sharp, but the whole rest of the bill is actually quite soft. So it's easy enough to just wedge your fingers in the middle and hold it that way. Um, but a good example of this is I was talking to somebody last summer about a pelican that they had found in Moss Landing, tangled in fishing line. I was talking to someone who was calling because someone else was dealing with it. They were in the process of pulling hooks out of the bird and I said, please don't do that. Um, and, and then I asked like, are, you, are they holding the beak Closed. And they said yes, and I said, please open the beak up so the bird doesn't suffocate. Um, so just if you find yourself in the position of handling a bird that you don't know anything about, um, you can always call us and we'll give you tips on how specifically to handle that bird because they're not all the same. Birds of prey. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so again, you see the size of the gloves that we are wearing? <laughs> um, <laughs> So hawks, falcons, eagles, owls, vultures. Um, if you are in the position of trying to contain one of these birds for us, um, I usually ask people to, uh, to tip something over the bird. Don't actually grab it unless you are comfortable doing so and have something to protect yourself because those talons are no joke. Um, so uh, garbage can, laundry bin, um, box if you can weight it down, they're stronger than you think that they are. Anything that you can just sort of contain the bird with. This is another thing that we'll get a lot if I ask somebody to contain the animal and they say, oh, well, it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and the number of times that I have gone out for an animal that definitely wasn't going anywhere and it, <laughs> boy, it went somewhere. Um, <laughs> and then also, even if it doesn't go anywhere, it's less stressful for the bird to be in a dark, safe environment. Um, if for no other reason than Crows, when they see a down bird of prey, go nuts. And they will start dive bombing that bird and, and like 
making a ton of noise and stressing it out. Um, you know, other birds might come along and mess with it. Other animals could mess with it. It could start like trying to get away and rolling around and hurting itself. If, if you can contain it, that is safest for the bird and gives us the best chance of actually getting a hold of that animal. Um, if you do have to scoop it up, um, use a heavy towel or blanket to cover the body and the head. Um, and if you can control the legs, do so or hold them away from you. And I'll show you how to do that. Um, but don't be grabbing the talons unless you have um, some significant protected gear. Uh, great horns for their body size have, I think, the, the biggest grip strength of any birds that we get, like a birds of prey here. So even though a golden eagle's feet are bigger, like compared to its body size, its, its grip is actually not as strong as a great horn. Like they can, they grab you and they don't let go. Um, so talons are sharp. Wear leather gloves if you have them. It hurts to have one of those in, in your body. Um, and get them into a container as soon as possible. Don't hold them if you don't have to. Um, dog crates work great for this. Um, anything else with uh, that is escape proof because they will bust out if you just, just like tip a cardboard box on top of them they're probably going to bust out once they come to um, a lot of times people bring us these because they've hit a window and they are stunned just long enough for you to get something over them but once that wears off they're going to try to run or fly or attack you they'll <laughs> roll on their backs and kick at you <laughs> um, so uh, this is an example of uh, when people call us about hawks or owls um, i will kind of float the idea of if you can tip anything over them, great, but I'll, I'll, I will come out and do that for you. You don't have to, you don't have to do that if you're not comfortable. <coughs> so transporting to the wildlife center, if you have something to put the bird in, <laughs> do that. Um, don't hold it any more than necessary. Uh, you can put like a towel or a blanket in the box with the bird so they have something to sit on and grip onto, and so they're not just like slip sliding in the bottom of the box as you're driving. Um, avoid talking to the bird uh, or around the bird. Again, they're, we are predators to them, so it is, and I, I've, I've done this myself. You want to be soothing, you want to be like, it's okay, we're going to get there soon, it's going to be fine, and this is not helping at all. All the bird hears is your voice and the, and the sound of the car, and it's freaking out. Um, and uh, keep them warm during transport, unless it seems like they're overheating. This is especially important for baby birds. They get cold really fast. Um, so you don't need to like blast the heater, but uh, just be mindful of temperature if you can. Hey, what, what, mm -hmm. are you, oh, that last thing you yeah. about overheating. Oh yeah. What would be the <clears throat> so um, open mouth breathing, which can be hard in birds of prey because one of their display mechanisms is to open their mouths and stick their tongues out at you. They go like, and they try to scare you that way. Um, but you can watch their throats and see if they're breathing really fast. Also, opening wings up to like air themselves out. Um, a bird that is really hyperthermic will, um, you know, they'll get kind of like weak. It's like heat stroke in people. Like you start off kind of like sweating and then you, and then you like stop feeling, you know, you, you stop sweating and then you kind of get like lethargic and stuff. Usually it's the other issue that we have. Usually birds are too cold when they come to us. Um, the, <clears throat> the only times they tend to really overheat is if they've been like out in the baking sun or if they've been handled so much that they're, that they're just like starting to freak out. And at that point we set them aside and we don't do anything to them for like an hour. <laughs> we just let them chill out and then we circle back to actually looking at them. <clears throat> uh, so let's say you did all these things right and it happens to be nighttime. <laughs> and we are not around. <clears throat> um, during the winter, uh, fall and winter, we are here, uh, we're open like eight to five. Um, spring and summer, that does extend. We start earlier and end later because uh, all of our baby animals need to be fed uh, as much as possible throughout the day. So baby birds get fed depending on how old they are, anything from every 20 minutes or so throughout the day, um, up to like an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, and it just depends on the age. So we get there pretty early, um, but you'll notice that none of that tells you what to do if you find a bird at 2 a.m. 
Um, we used to provide overnight uh, on-call hours. We don't do that anymore. So uh, we have a, a lot of information on our website about what to do. But basically, if you find a bird in distress outside of our normal hours, um, contain it like you would otherwise and try to keep it somewhere safe overnight. Um, you want it to be warm, dark, and quiet. Those are the big three. Um, don't let pets or children interact with the bird. Don't put a bird in a box in the same room that your cat sleeps in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> seems, seems like it should be obvious. Uh, don't offer it any food or water, again, because you probably don't have what it wants. Very likely, it's a, unless you have an owl um, or a poor will, they're, they're, gonna want, they, they're not gonna wanna eat overnight anyway. They're just gonna wanna sleep. Um, and water uh, dishes, if the bird isn't feeling super well and it kind of like rolls into it, they can get cold overnight. Um, they can get like wet and shivery. Um, and again, if it's, if it's nighttime, they're just gonna wanna tuck their heads in and, and go to sleep. Uh, call us first thing in the morning to coordinate either dropping the bird off with us or we can come to you. And then on our website, we have a, a whole page called Get Help with Wildlife. Um, and it tells you everything to do. It also has a lot of different pages specific to different species. So we've got a page about raccoons. We've got one about opossums. We've got one about skunks. We've got one about hawks and owls. Um, but in general, it's contain it, keep it somewhere safe, call us in the morning. How else can you help birds? So there's so many ways that you can help birds. Um, and I know that you guys all care about birds because you are at an even on top. Uh, so you probably already all know these things, but um, a big one is uh, trying to keep our birds wild. Um, so providing native food sources in your garden. Uh, native plants and flowers are not only going to provide natural food items, and natural cover for the birds, but they have the benefit of being, uh, you know, native to this area, so they're probably going to tolerate not getting a whole lot of rain, which is like a win-win. <laughs> um, don't use rat poisons or sticky traps. Uh, again, that's, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but rat poison, as we know, will work its way up the food chain. It doesn't just kill the rats, it kills the hawks and the bobcats and the foxes and all of that. Um, keep your cats inside. I know this is a hard one. <laughs> I know that, uh, that a lot of cats have sort of gotten used to being outside and they put up a, a big fight when you tell them that they can't do it anymore, but they are unnatural predators and they kill so many birds every year. Every year, a huge percentage of the baby birds we get in um, have parents. They could be raised by, by their parents. They should be out there, but a cat brought them into the house and now they have puncture wounds now we just have to keep that bird because cats have really aggressive bacteria in their mouths and birds that get caught by cats need to go on antibiotics or they can get um, really bad like abscesses and die. So, and that's always really annoying when you have like a fat, healthy baby bird and you know it has parents in the area, but because a cat caught it, now it just has to grow up at the wildlife center. Um, and then keep wild animals wild. Um, don't, don't feed wildlife. Uh, they have plenty of food here, especially here. It never gets below 40 degrees here. There's, there's plenty of food out there for the birds. Um, ducks don't need to eat bread. <laughs> they, got, they got plenty of other food. Um, and also animals that are habituated to people and expect to get food from people have much lower chances of survival ultimately. Also creating areas where a bunch of birds flock unnaturally to one area for food causes um, the spread of disease. Um, it, can, uh, it can cause territorial issues. Uh, we get a lot of hummingbirds are a good example of this when you have like a bunch of hummingbirds that all swarm to like feeders. The males are really territorial and they will kill each other. Um, <coughs> Or I don't know if you guys remember, I think it was like two or three years ago, we had a big pine siskin die off. Do you guys remember that? Yes. And we, um, we put out a press release asking people to please take down their feeders. And it was because the pine siskins were all getting salmonella, which is something that happens in a lot of other kinds of songbirds. But for whatever reason, uh, the siskins are really ill-equipped to deal with it. And what salmonella does is it causes an inflammation in the uh, esophagus and the crop. So the birds 
uh, have a lot of pain in their throat. They can't eat. They want to eat. So they hang out by the bird feeders and continue to spread the salmonella, but they can't actually eat anything. And then we find, you find a bunch of dead or dying pine siskins that are emaciated that were found at bird feeders. So it's one of those things where the more kind of unnatural congregation spots you have for birds, the more likely you are to have uh, a lot of um, unintended consequences. So keep the wild animals wild. We'll go out and look at them in their natural environment. What are some common, um, what are some common, um, what would be the term, um, like for rodenticide poisoning, mm -hmm. what, like common symptoms of that? Um, central nervous system uh, issues mostly. So um, birds that are, um, which is hard because a lot of, um, you guys have probably heard about the avian influenza that's going around. Um, so bird flu is something that is always happening. But the most recent strain is highly pathogenic. It's super deadly, it spreads like wildfire. And it can cause a lot of similar symptoms to rodenticide poisoning and lead poisoning, which are um, neurologic issues. So the bird might have trouble standing, it might be like head ticking, it might be sort of mentally dull, like it's just not really reacting the way that a bird should, um, you know, kind of like shaky. And if, uh, if we know that it's rodenticide poisoning or lead poisoning, those are treatable. Uh, avian influenza is not, and it uh, can be really scary when you have a bird that's behaving weirdly and you don't know why, and it could be a disease that could spread very easily to all the other birds that you are currently taking care of. So um, it's uh, right now we have uh, quarantine protocols in place and we're really judicious about the birds that we keep, and if they're showing any kind of weird neuro behaviors and we didn't just like someone didn't see them hit a window. <laughs> like if you, you saw that bird collide with a window or get smacked by a car, that's one thing. But if you just find a hawk like sitting somewhere, like having seizures, that could be so many different things. So rodenticide poisoning is one of those things that you need to do more testing in order to have a definitive diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> most rodenticides are anticoagulants. So a good test is to take blood and see if it clots at all. Um, and we can, we can treat rodenticide if we catch it early enough. <clears throat> um, okay, so other helpful resources. So uh, that is our phone number up there. Uh, that is the direct line to the Wildlife Center. If you call the main SPCA line, uh, sometimes you will get kind of stuck in a loopy phone tree. <laughs> um, and especially if it's on the weekends, we don't always have a receptionist. So if you wanna to talk to the Wildlife Center, that is the number two call. Um, we also have our website, and under our programs and resources tab, there is a uh, wildlife rescue and rehabilitation section, and then get help with wildlife that has a ton of information about uh, lots of different kinds of animals, and also who to call for the animals that we don't take. So we treat uh, basically everything in the county, with the exception of a few um, specific species. So we don't take bears or mountain lions because um, we're not permitted for them. Um, we don't do, what is it, bighorn sheep or elk. Um, it's, it just says specifically in our permits we're not allowed to do that. Um, marine mammals we don't take. Um, and there are certain invasive species that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has asked us not to make any more of. Um, so <laughs> red foxes. Are a good example. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on the feeder? They're so yeah. tricky. So yeah, so we are allowed to rehabilitate spotted fawns. Anything that no longer has spots is considered an adult deer in the eyes of fish and wildlife, even if it's still young. Um, and the the reason for that is um, it's again like an enclosure thing. They're just not covered in our permits, and they're high stress animals. Um, they're they're really prone to that capture myopathy. I've seen a deer die because it was on the wrong side of a fence. She she jumped a fence into a playground um, when school was happening, and she couldn't figure out how to get back out, and she ran until she keeled over. Um, and that's what happens when they're in an enclosed space. So with deer, um, what we will do is we will provide humane euthanasia if the deer is dying, um, or if it's like critically injured and it's going to die. But we have to be able to catch it. Um, we don't have tranquilizing guns, 
Uh, the way that I catch deer is to physically jump on top of them and wrestle them to the ground. <laughs> um, so if it's a buck and he's got a broken leg but he is still running, there's no way I'm gonna catch that deer. So in that case, we refer people to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, they can send out wardens that do have tranquilizing guns, um, but they don't always have wardens in our area. They're kind of sporadically spread out uh, in our region. Um, so we will go out and get deer unstuck from fences. We will reunite fawns with their parents. We will, um, if a deer is like dying on the side of the road, uh, we'll coordinate with Highway Patrol and go out and euthanize that deer. But if they're still up and and coping, um, you know, if, if like the injured, you know, it's an old injured leg, they're moving slowly, but they're still doing their thing. Since the only thing we can offer is euthanasia, we kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, there was one doe that was hanging out on like Eardley for ages, like David and Eardley, and she had such a bad leg. She had like her back left leg was so broken, but she was she went for years and she had fawns every year. And every year we would get calls about her, and then they'd, they'd be like, "There's a deer, and she has a back left leg." And I'd be like, "Where is it?" Eardley. Yeah, I know that deer. And like she looked, she looked bad. Like I, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not surprised people called us about her, but she kept having fawns and she kept doing her thing and. Like, I, I can't make anything better for her, so we kind of just let it ride. Um, but if they start doing increasingly poorly, we obviously don't want any of those animals to suffer. So if they're down and it's safe enough for us to get them, uh, we will euthanize them. But if they're still up and mobile, uh, even on three legs, they're almost always faster than we are. And at that point, we have to refer them to Fish and Wildlife. How about cats and skunks? We do, yeah. So we do rabies vector species. Um, bats and skunks are one of those things where if there is confirmed contact with a person or a pet, uh, the Department of uh, the Health, the Health Department wants to test that animal for rabies um, because they, it is a very real possibility that those animals could be a reservoir for rabies. So in that case, um, those animals usually get picked up by animal services. They handle all the testing. We're not really involved. Um, otherwise, we do rehabilitate bats and skunks. All of our, the staff that handle them are rabies vaccinated, um, so that we don't. So that if we do get bitten, it's not uh, as as big of a deal. Um, that's a newer thing that we're doing. We didn't used to be able to do them. Uh, that's probably within the last six-ish years, five six years that we've started doing them. Um, and every year we get more and more skunks. So I think that they, I think they found out. I think in the skunk world, somebody, somebody said, hey, guess what? The SPCA will totally give you free food. So, um, but yeah, in a, if you do see a sick, uh, a sick looking skunk, um, that is one animal that I won't ask anybody to approach on their own. Um, not only because of the rabies thing, but nobody wants to get sprayed. I, yeah, uh, it's, it's something I'm very used to now, but I recognize not wanting to get sprayed. Um, and then bats are very hard to, um, whereas like a skunk, it's considered confirmed exposure if they bite you or you have other um, interactions with bodily fluids. A bat, their teeth are so tiny that they can bite you without you even really knowing it. It's like a paper cut. So if you handle a bat with your bare hands, that's considered exposure. Um, even if you don't think the bat bit you, it's too risky. So um, if you find a bat on the ground, um, definitely call us if you can like sometimes we'll have people like like sweep it into like a dustpan and then like put that in a box so they're never actually touching the bat um, or, or like wearing gardening gloves or something but yeah never touch a bat with your bare hands um, don't touch it if, if you have gloves wear them um, also wash your hands after <laughs> if you touch a wild animal wash your hands um, most of the things that birds have uh, don't necessarily jump to mammals that easily, but there are exceptions to that. Bird flu is one of them. Um, assume all wild animals are gross and wash your hands before you eat. Yeah, uh, and then if so, if you are outside of Monterey County, so if you're in Monterey County, where are the people to call? If you are outside of Monterey County, um, there are ways to find licensed rehabilitators of, in other parts of California. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has a whole list for them, and then, uh, if you are outside of California, the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association also has a list. Uh, we just got a call today, 
the SPCA for Monterey County has a really good web presence. And so sometimes when people Google what to do, injured, you know, fill in the blank, we pop up. Uh, my boss talked to somebody, I think in Colorado today, about a deer. Um, it's one of those things where you start the conversation and you start to talk to them about what to do. And then you find out where they are and you're like, oh, I, don't, I, can't, I can't help you at all. <laughs> I talked to a woman once for a very long time about a baby bird um, that was on the ground, she couldn't find a nest, it was like a high traffic area, she was afraid that like, you know, people were gonna mess with the bird and you know, I finally was like, okay, well maybe I can come out and see if I can, you know, locate parents or something. And I asked her what city she was calling from and I didn't recognize the name. And then I said, what county are you calling from? And I still didn't recognize the name. And I said, what state are you calling from? And she was in Texas. And we were, we were both shocked. <laughs> I was like, I'm in California. And she's like, what? I had no idea. So, you know, I had to like look up what rehabilitation facility she should call in Texas. Um, but they're all over the place. Uh, you just need to know where to look. So if you find yourself outside of California um, and that, that's the place to go, usually if I am, because I'm me and because I do this for a living, uh, if I'm traveling somewhere, uh, that I'm unfamiliar with, I Google local wildlife centers just so I know if I find an injured thing, where to take it. <laughs> yes. So based on my experience uh, working uh, with uh, marine mammal center, mm -hmm. they always ask for us to send a picture in yes. so they can triage, see yeah. where the animal is located. Yeah. Did you ever have a situation where you said, we would love to help, but we cannot help that bird because it's in a weird space? Yeah, yeah. So if it's unsafe for us to get the bird, um, you know, uh, so I, I have many skills, but I, I cannot fly. And I, I cannot teleport. I have average speed and strength. I'm not a I'm not an Olympian. So you know, if there's a bird that has a broken leg but is up in a tree, I can't I can't help you. Um, and then also like if there's sometimes we'll see seabirds um, that look like they are in distress, like maybe they're entangled or something, but they're like out on the rocks in the water, and we don't have boats. I can't I can't get to that bird. Um, you know, same thing with like. If it's like down in a gully and it would require me to rappel down a cliff to get to that animal, I, I can't do anything about that and that is sad. You know, Unfortunately, we have to wait for the animal to get somewhere where it would be safe for staff to respond. Um, in terms of like, uh, if there are animals on roadways, we will always have highway patrol or local uh, police department come out and do traffic control for us so that we don't get hit on the side of the road while we're trying to take care of a deer. <laughs> um, and uh, we work closely with um, some other uh, or some other businesses in the area will actually hold birds for us. So Monterey Bay Kayaks, both in Monterey and in Moss Landing, they have boxes. They will hold a bird for you. If you bring them a bird and say, like, can you call the SPCA? They have like our SPCA carriers and they will hold birds for us. Okay. Same thing with the um, Harbor Master's Office, both in Monterey Harbor and Moss Landing. Um, there are some other uh, in Bari, will hold birds for us too. Um, and a lot of businesses will too, you know, we get a lot of people who are uh, tourists here, they're traveling, they don't necessarily, they might not have a car, they might not have time to get us an animal, but we'll say, hey, can you, can you like find a business and just ask if they can put that bird in their bathroom and then I can go get it, um, just so long as I know where it is. Um, but yeah, usually we will, if there is at all a way for me to get that animal, I will. We do all of Monterey County, uh, which goes north up to the Pajaro River and south almost down to San Luis Obispo, essentially. It's like San Miguel. Um, and then east, I'm not sure exactly where our county line is east, actually. We don't get that many calls. <laughs> um, on the, it's mostly along like the peninsula here, but um, we, do, we do all of Monterey County. So I'll drive multiple hours to get that pigeon. That's what I gotta do. <laughs> I just need to know that it is contained and that it actually needs help and that it will still be alive when I get there. Um, yeah, so any other questions? Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, uh, uh, a saw or is a pygmy owl, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, yes? If we see rat poison, what we think is rat poison in mm -hmm. a business or public facility, what should we do? So unfortunately, it is still legal to use, which is, which is really unfortunate. I know that there have been several initiatives people have tried to get it outlawed and um, for right now it is still legal so um, 
you know, I think that the way that this changes is with public outcry, you know, if, uh, especially if it's uh, a business that you frequent or, um, you know, an, an organization that, that you think you could change the mind or if you live in like a housing complex and you see them using it, you know, contacting whoever's in charge of putting this stuff out and just being like, hey, is there any other way that we can do this? There are humane road control uh, methods. Um, I know that the, um, there's a Facebook group. I live in Santa Cruz, so I know the Santa Cruz one, but it's like Santa Cruz Raptors are awesome. It's like scraps or something. And there, uh, I think that there's other groups locally um, that are really big on pushing, um, you know, more humane uh, methods of roaming control. A big one is just building more owl boxes and, and encouraging more birds of prey to the area. Um, but, you know, there are certain areas where like ground squirrels are sort of out of control and like, you know, I, <laughs> no amount of birds of prey are going to take out all of the ground squirrels that like point pinos. Like they're just, they're just everywhere. Um, so yeah, it's, a uh, it's, it's one of those things kind of like with, um, you know, non-lead ammunition where it just takes a lot of people writing a lot of letters and making it clear that we care about this issue um, because otherwise it is, uh, you know, a, an effective and, and known way to control rodents and people are going to keep doing what they've always done until they have a reason to change. So, yeah. Do you accept volunteers? <laughs> I have a group of volunteers in the front row. Are you asking for more people to train, Donna? <laughs> we do. If you want to help, that should have been a how else to help birds. You could volunteer with us. Um, we do accept volunteers. Um, we're coming into our busy spring and summer season uh, when we kind of need the most volunteers. If you have any desire to work hands-on with wildlife rehab, I am real. I used to be a volunteer myself. I'm real big on training people to be as involved as they want to be. Um, I have some volunteers who want to do everything. They want to help pull up meds. They want to give injections. They want to, you know, do. All, they want to foster baby mammals that need to be fed overnight. And then I have some volunteers that want to do our laundry. And, and I love them all equally. Um, so if that's you, you do not need to be the kind of person that wants to get poop all over yourself in order to like help out at the wildlife center. You can help in a variety of ways. So yes, we do take volunteers. So uh, if you want to volunteer, <laughs> <laughs> what should they do, Donna? How do they contact you? They go online. They can go online <laughs> to our website. There's a whole volunteer section. You can get in touch with our volunteer coordinator. Um, there are many ways you can volunteer at the SPCA in all of the different departments. The Wildlife Center is just one of many programs that we offer. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if uh, a bird runs into a window. Mm -hmm. Um, do, is it appropriate to, to watch it and just see if it recovers, or should we assume automatically that it's going to have injuries yeah. that need to be attended to? So the, um, the, there's, a, but both of those are true. So for many years, kind of the, uh, the going wisdom and the way that we did it, and I think the way that a lot of wildlife centers did it, was um, give the bird an hour. If it doesn't fly away after that, then something's wrong and it should come in. Um, and there has been there's been some um, indication that uh, even if the bird flies away, like it might still be in enough pain that like survival is is less so than it would have been. You know, the bird the initial reaction is to want to fly away. So if nothing's broken, it will fly. But it has a wicked headache. <laughs> um, so you know, if we can give that bird pain management at least for a day, um, with tiny little songbirds. Sometimes they won't eat in care um, because they're so stressed out. So in that case, if they hit a window yesterday, um, they're flying fine. They are not eating. That bird only weighs eight grams to begin with, and I don't want it to lose any weight. I'll just let it go. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it a few good pain meds and some fluids, and be like, "You leave now." Um, but in general, if they hit a window, we want to at least make sure that they didn't. Sometimes they can have soft tissue injuries that aren't immediately apparent, like they're flying, but they're not flying great, you know, that kind of thing. So we usually encourage people to at least bring them to us for an assessment so we can see how they're doing. If they seem completely fine, um, I will just give them some meds and give them back to you and you can let them go. Um, but oftentimes, I know if I hit a window going that speed, I probably want a day to sit down. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions?
Up. Yeah, if you want to bring the lights up, and then I'll entertain you with my with my stuffed animals.